In the months leading to D-Day, many high-ranking German officers, like the renowned Erwin Rommel, scoffed at the seemingly preposterous notion of an Allied landing in Europe. The thought, some believed, was mere fantasy. This was not entirely without reason. The challenges the Allies faced were monumental. Even bolstered by the might and industry of the United States, their task seemed nothing short of Herculean. They would need to mobilize an army of unparalleled proportions, accompanied by a flotilla of amphibious vessels unheard of in scale. Even if they succeeded in this, a far greater test awaited them. They would be up against the formidable German Atlantic Wall, an impenetrable fortress bristling with artillery and manned by well-prepared and on-guard soldiers. And should they miraculously gain a foothold on the hallowed sands of France, the logistics of supplying such a vast army and fueling thousands of tanks across the choppy waters of the English Channel was a problem that would require a solution nothing short of divine intervention. Yet, with this knowledge, the Allies began preparing. They started working towards creating their own miracle, Operation Pluto. Britain would have to take on the challenge of constructing massive submarine oil lines under the English Channel in a daring and unprecedented effort. The structure was to be their lifeline, their answer to the supply problem, supporting Operation Overlord. These pipelines were to pump millions of gallons of oil, the black blood that would fuel the Allies' relentless advance toward the liberation of Europe. There was, however, a catch, one challenge that made this extraordinary task even more dangerous. The Allies had to lay the pipelines in utmost secrecy, ensuring the Germans remained utterly oblivious to their plans. When the Allies planned the D-Day landings, also known as Operation Overlord, they understood that success would hinge on one critical element, the ability to sustain their forces in continental Europe with a steady fuel supply. They would need to support an army of hundreds of thousands, not to mention the thousands of fuel-guzzling vehicles. Even a single Sherman tank could consume about 100 gallons of fuel daily. While some partisan networks offered their help, their supplies would barely dent the need for the vast war machine the Allies were assembling. Their original plan considered using only jerry cans and tankers, but the idea was quickly dismissed. This method could not sustain the massive supply lines necessary for the battle that was to come. Relying entirely on tankers to ship fuel over the channel was also unwise. The German submarines and air attacks made the sea a dangerous gauntlet. Storing large quantities of fuel on the ground was equally risky, turning these depots into tempting targets for the enemy. Thus, the ideal solution became clear, a delivery system with great capacity and sustained functionality, hidden from the prying eyes of the German Wehrmacht. Vice Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, the chief of combined operations tasked with planning the Allied invasion, proposed a seemingly foolhardy idea to the Secretary for Petroleum, Geoffrey Lloyd. They would lay oil pipelines all the way across the English Channel. At the time, this seemed like an impossible feat. Submarine pipelines existed, but only for short distances within ports. Never had a pipeline been laid across such a vast distance under the tough currents and tidal conditions of the English Channel. The entire pipeline would need to be laid in a single night to minimize enemy interference and tidal effects, making the task even more daunting. The British War Office estimated that more than 60% of the Expeditionary Force's supplies would consist of petrol, oil and lubricants. While pipelines were not the only method being considered, they did seem the most ideal. The Allies planned to primarily rely on small, shallow-draft coastal tankers, with 30 already under construction. A whole American manufacturing plant was shipped to London to create the 20 million jerry cans required, and by 1944, they had stockpiled 250,000 long tons of packaged petrol and diesel fuel in the UK. Despite all these measures, the method of delivery was risky. If the Germans found a way to compromise the tankers, the entire Allied effort could be left stranded on the beaches of Normandy, and the war machine would be starved of fuel. The Allies knew they were on the precipice of a monumental undertaking, the scale of which had never been seen before. After careful analysis and consideration of the pipeline scheme, the idea was deemed unfeasible. No pipeline could be deployed with enough speed and secrecy while meeting the fuel demands that the Allied forces would need. The idea was dead, at least temporarily. As the plan was nearly scratched, a new figure emerged to change the minds of Allied strategists, 
Clifford Hartley, the chief engineer of the oil company Anglo-Iranian, happened upon a conversation among specialists during his visit to the Petroleum Warfare Department. In contrast to his skeptical peers, Hartley viewed the conundrum as a challenge to be met head-on. Hartley's confidence was born in the treacherous landscapes of Iran, where the Anglo-Iranian team had installed a three-inch pipeline capable of delivering a remarkable 100,000 imperial gallons per day under enormous pressure. His daring proposal involved creating a continuous length of the pipeline, a marine version of a communication cable stripped of its core and insulation, fortified with armor to withstand the internal pressure. A cable layer ship, he suggested, could place this pipeline with the scope for additional capacity by laying multiple lines. This proposition blossomed into the high-stakes mission, Operation Pluto, an acronym for Pipeline Under the Ocean. The daunting task was placed under the watchful authority of the Chief of Staff to the Supreme Allied Commander, or Cossack, led by the strategic mind of Major General Neville Brownjohn, assisted by a team of American colonels and Major Generals. The man chosen to oversee Operation Pluto was Captain John Fenwick Hutchings. The primary objective of Operation Pluto was to establish flexible pipelines between England and France, pumping fuel directly to the areas of greatest need. The plan involved constructing a mammoth 130-kilometer pipeline stretching from the Isle of Wight to the port on saint cherbourg to create a vital connection between Omaha and Gold Beaches. This ingenious solution significantly diminished the logistical complications and vulnerabilities inherent in conventional delivery methods, providing a steady and reliable fuel source. Without this lifeline, the entire operation could stall, leaving the invading forces susceptible to German reprisals. In tandem with the Red Ball Express, a complex network of road, rail and additional pipelines, the Pluto pipelines were to deliver vast amounts of fuel and other liquid supplies required for the swift advancement of Allied forces across France and into Germany. The Allies had learned the cost of being unprepared for an amphibious assault from the bitter lessons of World War I, when British, New Zealander and Australian forces failed to progress from the Turkish Gallipoli Peninsula and were eventually forced to retreat. These lessons would be reinforced with the landings at Italian Anzio, where American, British and Canadian troops spent months struggling with limited progress and a lack of supplies. Fully aware that petroleum, the lifeblood of their military machines, would be a prime target for German attacks, the Allies placed their hopes on Operation Pluto as part of a broad and complex system of oil supply that would help the Allies liberate Europe from the grasp of the Third Reich. The most challenging task of the project now unfolded before Allied engineers, creating enormously long pipelines capable of spanning the English Channel. Engineered to be both flexible and sturdy, these pipelines were built for transporting a large amount of fuel. Two unique designs emerged, the Hayes, an amalgamation of lead and steel wire, and the Hamel, a hardy construction of pure steel. Factories that had once manufactured submarine cables were repurposed to construct the Hayes pipelines, Built by Siemens Brothers, a leaded core was encased in layers of paper insulation, steel armor, and a protective layer of jute and tar. The National Physical Laboratory contributed to developing a pipeline weighing an impressive 55 long tons per nautical mile. But lead, a critical resource, was in short supply. The unthinkable idea of scavenging it from church roofs and bells was discarded. Instead, a second design, one forged from steel, was deemed the practical alternative. This steel counterpart, Hamel, was less flexible but shared the size of the haze. Developed by engineers at the Iraq Petroleum Company and the Burma Oil Company, the Hamel was a tribute to its creators, H. A. Hammock and B. J. Ellis. Despite their rigidity, it was decided that Hamel pipelines would conclude with sections of the more flexible haze. To facilitate this, a new device was introduced, the Conan drum. Each Hamel pipeline was made from sections of steel pipe, joined by specially designed screw joints, and churned out at a rate of 30 miles per week. This speedy development resulted from the combined efforts of the British Ministry of Fuel and Power, businesses, and academic researchers. Urgency fueled their work, turning concepts into reality in less than a year. Testing began at River Medway in May of 1942, followed by trials with vertical triple ram pumps across the Firth of Clyde in June. 
With Britain's manufacturing capacity strained, sections of the Hayes pipeline were produced in the US. The project, now known as Pluto, was officially included in the war plans in June 1942. Trials indicated a necessity to maintain an internal pressure of around seven bars throughout manufacturing. The project faced a logistical challenge, as British cable ships could not handle the pipelines. Merchant ships had to be transformed and equipped with steel tanks, hauling gear, sheaves and guides provided by Johnson & Phillips. Production started on August 14, 1942, utilising steel from Corby Steelworks. By October, HMS Holdfast was loaded with 30 miles of pipes. Full-scale rehearsals carried on through late December, the pipelines withstanding a rough passage through the Bristol Channel. The trials exceeded expectations, allowing for a reduction in the number of pipes without sacrificing the volume of fuel. Against all odds, the complex project was a resounding success. June 6, 1944, the dawn of Operation Overlord, saw the emergence of a fleet of unprecedented magnitude. Over 6,000 vessels, from towering battleships to agile landing crafts, surged through the grey swells of the English Channel towards Normandy. These vessels bore the mighty load of the Allied forces, more than 150,000 soldiers, each an integral part of this grand strategy. The explosive symphony of naval artillery ruptured the eerie silence of the morning. Massive guns fired with relentless fury, thunderous blasts echoing off the water's surface. Above, a swarm of over 12,000 aircraft filled the sky, their roaring engines adding to the tumultuous orchestration of war. On land, an array of tanks, including Sherman's, Churchill's and specialised Hobart's funnies, rumbled to life, embarking on the journey through Europe. Powering this colossal war machine required an unfathomable quantity of fuel, oil and lubricants. The mammoth task of supplying these resources rested on the shoulders of Operation Pluto and its engineers. In the weeks before and after D-Day, crews tirelessly laboured day and night against the clock and tackled challenges to deliver what was needed to the advancing Allied forces. Cable-laying ships, modified for the extraordinary mission, were deployed. The civilian passenger ship London was the first to be adapted to house the immense spool around which the new pipe was coiled. Despite the rigorous planning, the project hit an unexpected hurdle when a destroyer accidentally ensnared the pipeline with its anchor, hampering the initial phase. Yet on August 14, 1944, the line from the Isle of Wight to Cherbourg was successfully laid, with more slated to follow. Several attempts to lay both Hayes and Hamel pipes were made, but a portion of the network failed before it could become operational. Sir Donald Banks, a key figure in the operation, acknowledged the cable laying process had been mastered, but the final steps of connecting the shore ends and repairing undersea leaks posed significant challenges. By September 18th, the final version of the Hayes undersea pipe was ready for commissioning. By September 22nd, it was fully operational. However, it was approximately three months behind schedule. The Hamel pipe followed closely, ready by September 29th. Both pipelines, however, failed on October 3rd due to an overestimation in fuel pumping capacity, leading to the cancellation of the Cherbourg line. As the front lines moved closer to Germany, 17 additional pipelines were laid, each linked to discrete pumping stations along the English coast. Ingeniously concealed as cottages and garages to evade detection, these stations underscored the remarkable efforts undertaken to ensure the success of Operation Pluto. Despite the many challenges, the task had been done with great efficiency and ingenuity. Still, Operation Pluto's belated activation meant that it was not the primary fuel source during the initial phases of Operation Overlord. As a result, the Allies were compelled to depend on more conventional transportation methods to guarantee fuel availability for the troops until the Pluto lines were available in the subsequent months. In the aftermath of D-Day, amidst the chaos and turmoil of war-torn France, the pipelines and pumping stations of Operation Pluto emerged as a significant asset to the Allied forces. The pipelines offered a simpler and more efficient alternative to traditional fuel transportation methods such as tankers or jerry cans. Designated towns such as port en bessin and saint honorine des pertes strategically located at the heart of the Normandy landing beaches, were slated to house fuel depots for the second phase of Operation Pluto. On June 9, 1944, the installation of the miner system commenced. After several trying weeks, pipeline refueling became a reality. 
From August 12th to 21, more than two months post D-Day, a critical pipeline was installed connecting Shanklin, Britain to Quirkville, Normandy, a remarkable expanse of 130 kilometers. As the front line advanced, so did the pipeline network, reaching and fueling crucial depots at La Haye du Puy, Lesse, saint lô and Vire. Consequently, Allied forces could maintain a relentless momentum as their tanks, armoured vehicles and warplanes were continuously refuelled by the ever-extending pipeline system. In Normandy, the Allied gasoline service was a godsend. Thousands of vehicles and men queued to receive their share of the invaluable resource. Once filled, jerry cans were loaded onto trucks and dispersed among operational units, sustaining the critical refueling cycle. The pipeline system proved its worth in sheer volume. In January 1945, a daily average of 305 tonnes of fuel traversed the English Channel. By March, this figure surged to 3,048 tonnes, peaking at 4,000 tonnes in May. Cumulatively, between August 1944 and May 1945, a staggering 781,000 cubic metres of fuel journeyed the underwater route from Britain to France. Despite its innovative design and engineering feats, the Pluto distribution system's initial delays limited its operational effectiveness. By December, whether to continue with Operation Pluto was re-evaluated. The Allies in Antwerp were unloading an ocean-going tanker daily and coastal tankers were delivering substantial amounts to Ostend and Rouen. As the Allies liberated European territory, they gained access to many ports and railroad networks. These resources streamlined oil distribution and minimized the risk of German disruption. So as the Allies closed in on Berlin, the necessity for Pluto gradually diminished. When the conflict moved into Germany, the Dumbo line was connected to an inland pipeline system that stretched from Bologna to Antwerp, Eindhoven and finally Emmerich. On March 15, 1945, Dumbo surpassed its target of one million imperial gallons per day. By April 3rd, the Dumbo lines delivered a staggering 4,500 long tons daily to the Rhine. Despite the shifting tides of war, new lines continued to be laid until May 24th. However, the system was officially shut down on August 7th, 1945, to conserve manpower after delivering an impressive 180 million imperial gallons of petrol. Operation Pluto was officially disbanded on August 31st, with the Petroleum Warfare Department wrapping up operations on March 31st, 1946. Despite the grand scale of the efforts and the partial success, the pipeline network could not meet most of the invasion's fuel needs. From the summer to fall of 1944, it provided a mere 0.16% of the fuel consumed. This, however, does not negate the spirit of innovation and relentless determination that defined Operation Pluto. By the war's end, the Pluto pipelines were accountable for about 8% of petroleum product deliveries from the United Kingdom to the Allied Expeditionary Force in Northwest Europe. Most of the necessary oil in the initial invasion stages was shipped in through the Mulberry ports. The anticipated threat to Allied oil tankers from the German Navy and Air Force, a concern that spurred the creation of Operation Pluto, did not materialize. Nonetheless, the project became a revered icon of Western engineering prowess and the remarkable capacity of individuals to surmount enormous obstacles when united by a common goal. Operation Pluto embodied the Allies' meticulous preparation and knowledge accumulation, underpinning the success of D-Day and the liberation of Europe. If the Germans had found a way to disrupt conventional Allied fuel transport methods, Europe's liberation would have been delayed but not halted. The burgeoning Pluto network was poised to step in as an effective contingency plan, one the Germans had no knowledge of. In September 1946, operations commenced to disengage pipelines. The sale of the recovered cables generated higher profits than anticipated, substantially offsetting disengagement costs. Over the years, the significance of Operation Pluto has undergone considerable scrutiny, with fresh perspectives continually re-evaluating its impact. US naval historian Samuel Elliott Morrison recognized the pipeline's crucial role in supporting the Allied advance deep into German territory, Similarly, official historian Michael Postan described Operation Pluto as, quote, strategically important, tactically adventurous, and from the industrial point of view, strenuous. 
Proponents laud the operation as an engineering marvel, setting the stage for advancements in 21st century oil supply, especially regarding oil pipelines and duct systems. It's also celebrated as a masterful backup strategy for the Allies, ready for the gravest of scenarios. Winston Churchill, in his time, hailed Operation Pluto as emblematic of national pride, declaring it, quote, a wholly British achievement and a piece of amphibious engineering skill of which we may well be proud. Not everyone's views were positive. Given the setbacks and limited results observed during the pivotal weeks post D-Day, some deem the operation a considerable misstep. Derek Payton Smith in Oil, a study of wartime policy and administration, contended, quote, Pluto contributed nothing to Allied supplies at a time that would have been most valuable. That is, when no regular oil ports were available on the continent and the Allies were relying on the unsatisfactory port en Bessin. Operation Pluto symbolizes an audacious endeavor that melded wartime engineering with a spirit of innovation and collaboration. Uniting war departments, government agencies and private oil corporations, it showcased a joint effort to achieve the extraordinary. The true measure of Operation Pluto's success isn't in the raw numbers, which fell short of the Allies' highest hopes, but in its legacy as a testament to perseverance and creative problem-solving. This operation underscored the Allies' meticulous planning, foresight and strategic mindset, driving the broader war efforts. Operation Pluto wasn't just a plan A for the Allies, it represented multiple contingency plans to navigate challenges posed by the Axis powers. Even if it didn't revolutionize fuel logistics as anticipated, its engineering prowess remains a standout feat of World War II. No device from Germany could counteract the unparalleled preparation behind the grandest amphibious invasion in history. While Pluto's individual impact may have been limited, its role in the greater strategy significantly shaped 20th century history. A testament to unity in dire times, Operation Pluto reminds us of the remarkable lengths nations will pursue under a shared cause. The enduring legacy of this operation lies in its spirit of collaboration, resolve and ingenuity.